Hi everybody, my name is Brady and I'm a 19th century American historian and today we're going to be continuing Mr. Beat's American presidential election series. Unfortunately, it seems like this is going to be the last one we do before the 2020 election. Darn it, man. I really wanted to catch up. I was aiming for 2016. I only got to 1828, but man, we got close. But I am going to continue this series after the election. I set a very unrealistic goal and didn't even bother counting when I said, wouldn't it be cool if I caught up by the time the 2020 election came around? I didn't even think about whether or not that was feasible when I proposed it. So I almost immediately figured out that's not going to happen. So whatever, let's not even worry about it at this point. So today we're going to be doing the election of 1828. Um, as an election, I don't know how exciting it's going to be. Jackson's going to wreck. <laughs> we got Andrew Jackson in the age of Jackson, the Jacksonian era. It, it's goofy, gory, fun, and awful. Uh, so there should be plenty to talk about, I would think. So let's see what Mr. Beat has for us today. Mr. Beat presents presidential, presidential elections, elections in American, American history. history. The 11th presidential election in American history took place from Friday, October 31st. Hey, that's Halloween. To Dude, that works. Uh, I don't really disclose when I'm recording what videos or whatever. You just kind of see when they come out. But I'm recording this on Halloween. Isn't that funny? I should have made it work so that I could have this come out on Halloween. But I didn't even think about what date this would have fallen on. So, unfortunate. I should think about things more. Have, having my uploads come out on uh, coincidental, seemingly coincidental days, it, it would be nice. It would be things for people in the comments to point out. <laughs> Tuesday, December 2nd, 1828. Uh-oh, we got a rematch. Oof. Four years prior, after a four-way split with no majority candidate, John Quincy Adams was handed the election by the House of Representatives. Andrew Jackson, who finished second in the House vote, thought the election was shady. So John Quincy Adams' presidency, it's popularly thought of as mostly unremarkable. I, he, I guess he kind of had a classic political style that was more or less hands-off. He wasn't nearly as aggressive as somebody like Jackson. Jackson, he could get what he wanted. Um, I don't think John Quincy Adams was very good at dealing with opposition that way. He became much better as a politician later on in life, after his presidency. Some people think he should have gone through his congressional life first and then became president. He would have been far more effective. But, you know, that's just speculation. Accusing Henry Clay of a corrupt bargain to get Adams elected president so that Clay could be his secretary of state. We've talked about that part in the previous one, but long thing short, you know my opinion on that. I uh, I think it's totally okay for Clay to have supported Adams, but to do it with the expectation of having a position, it's a bit sketchy. It's, it's definitely not honorable, if that's what you're worried about. Just a few months after Jackson's defeat, the Tennessee legislature already re-nominated him for president, setting the stage for a rematch. There was no nominating no. caucus even held. Jackson's supporters, who called themselves, quote, Democrats, were rabid. They Democrats. This goes, it, it, like, it has the same lineage as the Democratic Repar Party of today, but I don't think it should be confused for the Democratic Party today. A lot of people like to oversimplify what the parties mean. Back then, the Democrats are thinking about completely different issues from what they're thinking about today. The political climate's like totally different. And some people will say the thing like, didn't the parties switch? And that's oversimplified as well, because uh, honestly, the parties of this time, we could talk about the parties during the Civil War, uh, they're all interested in completely different issues from contemporary Democrats and Republicans. So I think the best thing to say is that the Democrats are not the party of Jackson. The Republicans are not the party of Lincoln. They are 
they share a lineage, but it's really just a name. It doesn't really have anything behind it. So anybody really trying to claim these old figures as symbols of what the party stands for, uh, it comes off as a little bit shallow. They treated Jackson like a rock star. For the next three years, Jackson's support grew and grew. His supporters, also called Jacksonians, won more seats in Congress and the 1826 elections. The Jacksonian thing is interesting because uh, very few figures get that. They get a, uh, a political group named after them. We have two examples before this that are pretty uh, prominent. Jeffersonians and Hamiltonians. And you can tell how big that is. Of course, we'll have people who may identify as like Madisonians or Monrovians or something. I, I don't know, but they are not nearly as significant. Jackson is like the biggest thing since Jefferson. Meanwhile, the Jacksonians criticized John Quincy Adams for seemingly everything. Their mm -hmm. criticism peaked after Adams signed into law the Tariff of 1828, which increased tariff rates above 60%. Critics called it the Tariff of Abominations, as it ended up hurting the economy of several southern states. The Tariffs are difficult. Like, you're, you're never going to get people happy with tariffs. Those are... That, that is one of the things economically that any president that does one is going to be looked down upon for if they do it. There, there is, there's no tariff that gets passed where everybody's just in universal agreement like, yep, this is what we need. We need the revenue or whatever, and this is the way we should do it. That never happens. So this was not the best political decision by uh, John Quincy Adams. Needless to say, a distinct shift developed. Southerners began to largely support Jackson, while support for Adams was mostly only in northern states. President Adams was renominated by the endorsement of multiple state legislatures and partisan rallies. There was no caucus for his nomination either. Supporters of Adams called themselves National Republicans. Mm. Secretary of the Treasury Richard Rush officially ran as Adams' running mate. Wait, what the heck? Wasn't John Calhoun his vice president? Well, yes, but Calhoun had decided to run for re-election as Jackson's running mate, interestingly enough. <laughs> Let's see how their relationship works out. Um, Jackson's going to want to kill Calhoun. Like, legit, like, want to kill the guy. And if he had the opportunity, I think he genuinely would. And that is not hyperbole. Jackson has killed people before. He's like a crazy duelist and has no qualms about murdering people who get in his way. That, that's just not something he's worried about. Uh, so when he says, I really wish I shot Calhoun, I mean, I, 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 he means it. <laughs> and Calhoun is not a great guy either, but he's going to give Jackson a lot of trouble going forward. There's uh, the nullification crisis is what it's called, and that's something definitely i think mr b did a video on that one as well maybe we should check that out like after this one because that would be like the perfect thing to talk about uh but the nullification crisis is a huge constitutional issue where states are deciding whether or not they have the ability to nullify uh, nullify uh which basically means they're not going to recognize federal law so this is a huge threat to the national government because if any state can say like I don't want to follow this law, then you have no integrity, really, as a state. You, you have no power. Once one state can over, overpower all the other states, essentially, then, like, what is your national government? Now, now you're going back into these Articles of Confederation days. Both campaigns were incredibly nasty mudslinging was frequent and andrew jackson was certainly an easy target i mean the man was involved in the slave trade participated in the massacre of indians and had murdered multiple men in duels however yeah. things got particularly nasty when supporters of adams started talking trash about jackson's wife rachel Ooh, they even said jackson's touch that, mom man. was a prostitute so it got personal yeah jackson's not gonna be a huge fan of the adams people and adams he could be savage like the both of the Adamses. Well, let's talk about his dad too. You should hear some of the stuff that he wrote about Alexander Hamilton. I'll read that in a video down the line. I, I'm saving a particular quote 
from John Adams about uh, Alexander Hamilton's abundance of secretions. But yeah, these uh, these Adamses, they they have like this uh, like perception of like high moral character or something, and they were very principled dudes, but they could talk crap with the best of them, and that's. That's that's a low blow, dude. And Jackson's wife is gonna die pretty soon, so he's probably gonna resent them even more. People after that. also said, "Sorry, after, he's probably gonna res resent them even more after that." I, I accidentally hit the button too early. My bad. Sure. They even said Jackson's mom was a prostitute, so it got personal. People also said vicious things about Adams, saying he had surrendered an American girl to the Russian czar when he was the minister to Russia, and that he had used public funds to buy gambling devices, which turned out to be just a chess set and a pool table. By 18... Oh, that pool table, that that pissed off a lot of people for some reason. I, 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 I mean, it's cynical at this point. Like, political attacks... I guess they've been cynical since, like, the... I guess since Washington stepped down, really. Uh, there was nothing stopping it. Once everything got partisan, it was fair game here. And they're going to jump on you for literally everything. A and uh, the president gets a certain allowance to get stuff for the White House, decorations or whatever, and if he wanted to use that allowance on a pool table, that's fine. That, that's something that every single president does, so it's not unique in a sense. If you want to attack him for his uh, diplomatic work, that's another that's another thing here. Uh, the pool table thing is stupid. <laughs> In 1928, pretty much all white men could vote, and nearly every state chose its electors through popular vote. Jackson supporters organized a remarkable grassroots campaign that took advantage of this and brought out many first-time voters. Jackson and supporter Martin Van Buren took this campaign and created the modern Democratic Party. Okay, these are the founders of the Democratic Party here. Van Buren does not get that much credit. He is Jackson's successor, and he's going to be huge in Jackson's administration, uh, filling more than one position. Uh, he's going to be Secretary of State and Vice President at separate times because Jackson's presidency is complicated. A fitting title, as true democracy was actually becoming more of a reality. And mm. here are the results. Andrew Jackson got his revenge, winning the election and becoming the seventh president of the United States. But how much? He received 178 electoral votes and won 56% of the popular vote. John Quincy Adams received 83 electoral votes, getting 43.6% of the popular vote. So, yeah, the <laughs> it's not that uh it's not that far apart when you think about it. Like, yeah, Jackson wrecked him. He did. Uh, but you would think it would be more devastating than it was. But th I guess the regional divide has really uh, built this up. And the fact that we uh, it, we were having like a moment where we have some eastern and western divides and stuff like that. But this was a firmly northern-southern divide. Uh, while western states were probably still a little bit more likely to go for Jackson. Adams won almost the exact same states his dad did in the election of 1800. John Calhoun was re-elected vice president, becoming the second of two vice presidents to serve under two different presidents. Jackson's That's election rad. officially signaled a political movement toward a greater voice for the common man, known as Jacksonian democracy. Historians also call the election of 1828 the beginning of the second party system. So the thing with Jackson... Um... Him be, he was kind of a voice for the people. In a sense, he did agree with a lot of the stuff that they like. Like, when he goes after the banks, uh, normal people don't trust the banks. That, that There are people who do trust the banks, and there are people who benefit off of the banks. But ordinary people, you talk about farmers or whatever, they don't trust the banks. So the, he does have a populist element to it. A lot of people have argued that Jackson's... Uh, connections with the people on issues happen to be coincidental if he were uh, to disagree with the people jackson comes first it's not like he's def just deferring to the people he just happens to agree with the people it's one of those things um he doesn't just defer to the people because it's like well it's the will of the people who am i to deny them that no jackson is uh just an aggressive political shark who happens to be very good at appealing to the people um, yeah. 
as two new political parties, the Democratic Party and a new party called the Whig Party, would dominate American politics for the next 26 years. So the Whigs, they're not really the successor to the Federalists or anything like that. The Whigs are something new. Um, I'd say that the Whigs and the Democrats are both, in a sense, successors to the Democratic Republicans of Jefferson. But they go in different directions. I think the Whigs might identify more with somebody like James Madison, who was a little bit more moderate. He, he had some interesting reform ideas. Uh, the, the Whigs were definitely a little bit more hands-on with government. So they did have that in common with the Federalists. But I don't think you can see them as like successors, even though a lot of Federalists would go to join the Whigs. I think that's because that's the only other option besides the, uh, the Democratic Party, which they're not going that way. Tragically, Rachel Jackson became ill and died shortly after the election. She had been having chest pains throughout the campaign and was deeply upset by the personal attacks directed at her and her husband. Mm -hmm. After her death, Jackson accused the Adams campaign of causing her to die. After the results of the election were announced, a large mob entered the White House, damaging lots of stuff in it while doing so and horrifying Adams and his staff, who had escaped through the back door. Large punch bowls were set up to lure the crowd back outside. On March 4th, 1829, after Jackson was sworn in as president, Jackson again opened the White House to the public, and it turned into a crazy, huge party with more than 20,000 people showing up. This that is one of the first scandals of the uh, the Jackson presidency, uh, the party. Uh, and Jackson's not sticking around for that, man. He he's he's out during that. But the, yeah, there's they they made a mess of the place. That tends to happen. And the, the place wasn't all that nice to begin with. The White House is just generally not a nice place for a long time. It is a huge work in progress. The whole capital city is kind of like state buildings built upon garbage it's it's not a nice place at all um but yeah uh he throws this party and uh there's tobacco stuff everywhere they break stuff they they're getting all drunk and debauchery romping as they would say at the time all sorts of stuff and uh some of those things are uh, would have happened regardless, but uh, <laughs> but this this was a mess. This was a mess. This was a perfect example of how the times had dramatically changed. John Quincy Adams had represented the old status quo, mm. the last of the aristocratic, elitist, and dignified of the presidents. Jackson, on the other hand, represented the new guard, the working class, dirty, smelly, average Joe. Re this is interesting here because we have John Quincy Adams. He's going to go on to be an abolitionist. And he, he represents the elitists at the same time. Isn't that weird? We have, like, this guy, Andrew Jackson, he goes through two fortunes in his life, and he's the representative of the people. Uh, he's, in a sense, uh, kind of got a lot of aristocratic nature around him as well, but just the fact that he wears it different. And, and we have Adams who, yeah, he's judgy. He, uh, he's been hanging out in elite European circles for a long time. And I, I guess that's one of the things that has, he will never be able to escape at that point. He is very much uh, a European American, while Jackson, I guess, is uh, a full-blooded American. Ready to take the country for himself. 57.6% of the population. What were we last time at? Like a quarter? It's more than doubled. That's insane. <laughs> that's really cool. That That's really cool, though. That is one thing that I love about the age of Jackson. Um, seeing democracy expand. Not for women or black people or anything, but it is expanding. You take victories where you can get them or something. But that's a huge victory. Uh, on the part of democracy. I'll see you for the next election, buddy. Later, buddy. Later, buddy.
So next we got 1832. I think after here, I, I don't really think too much about the process of the elections. The elections just kind of happen, and I talk about what goes on more in between. Uh, but I know a few things about some of the fun elections that occur after this. They, we've got a few more between here and the Civil War, and I'm, I'm really excited for them. That should be fun. Uh, this is probably the last one that I think I really, really like. If I'm point, pointing at uh, elections that really stand out to me, I don't know if I... There must be a good example or two in between here. Uh, but I'm, I'm trying to think of which ones I'm, I'm excited about next. I mean, I'm excited about a lot of them, but, like, which ones do I think you guys would be excited about? I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But this was cool. This was a, a very fun time uh, leading up to the current election, which I'm um, not talking about right now. Not, not a huge fan of life right now uh, <laughs> regarding the election. Um, but the, we're all done. Well done. I guess we're gone. Okay, I, I have nothing left to say, really. Uh, I'm bad at sign-offs. So if you like this video, like this video. I'm going to be doing more of these eventually. I might take a break from them and come back in a little bit. Um, try out some other things. Maybe check out some different Mr. Beat videos, because he has so many other things. Maybe. All right. Thank you. Subscribe for more content every day, and I'll see you next time. Later.